am looking for more communication. Uh -huh. And uh, basically, I need to learn how to talk about my project in ways that uh, um, inspire and attract, um, yeah. and attract um, you know, help. And, uh, you know, one of the first things I asked for when somebody asked if they could help me um, was help asking for help. Um, so that's not exactly, yeah. you know, the, the kind of skill that I have um, and, uh, and comfort. <laughs> yeah, it's a kind of a universal deficit. Well, I don't know. There are, there are people. Yeah, there are people who are, were born, you know, like, like, you know, you. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I do like, like you know. <laughs> yeah, I don't think it's universal exactly. I I, I, I um, was talking uh, earlier about you know the commodification of self and you know the, the branding of, of people and how I'm kind of allergic to it and it's just you know it feels what is that term um, creepy. Yeah, to, <laughs> that's, um, that's a good one. That's a good one. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> And um, I, 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 the more I do my investigations, the more I think I should base it on the notion that the heart and mind are never truly separate, but there's a continuum and you can have a distance between head and heart that um, makes us less human. And the closer they are, it's typically more human. Um, yeah. Um, so just quick context. Um, I, I did, I wasn't in last week, but I watched the recording and your name uh -huh. came up. I don't think you were in either. I wasn't in, but your name came up in connection with, um, a couple of things. There's this thing weaving the world. Have you heard of this? I have. Okay. So yeah, Jerry, Jerry and, um, blocking on his name. You know our our Pete Kaminsky, so, huh? Pete Kaminsky, Peter Kaminsky. Pete, yeah, Pete mentioned. He said there were like these little subgroups. And he mentioned a, a couple of little clusters. You're and you're in one. And he said, you know, that's all in a way. That's a that's a the hidden part of OGM. This is all this stuff that's going on, kind of beneath the surface. Huh. It's um, and they absolutely were absolutely fine to be hidden for me. <laughs> yeah, well, but they were talking about how the challenge it creates is you know they're they're trying to manage just as you are i mean they're jerry and others are trying to manage their interface to the non-ogm world mm -hmm. and so what is your representation of ogm when you do that you know and and i'm is it an issue that there's this hidden stuff going on it's it's not a question of it's it's secret it's a question of it's hard to characterize it's um you know it's all it's part of the ooh, what what are we doing you know how do we express these things you know i'm that. sorry i uh i have a, an annoying um connection with the internet i'm gonna reboot and check back in but i, I let, let me try and ask you about the last say 17 seconds before i started talking what you said so we started out with you know hidden and a challenge about representing oneself yeah. as perhaps an ogm er or part of an ogm movement or a hashtag yeah but i missed the 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 part after that well i was talking about uh representing ogm as an idea mm -hmm. or as a a proposal or as a prospect and that that um you know that was a challenge um you know jerry's talked about that challenge uh, many times and so that's what was the conversation was more about it wasn't like uh let's do this it wasn't about um you know how do we are, are we acknowledging or are we hiding or are we forgetting what's going on with mark uh, in the background, no, no, it was more like about. Gee, there's lots going on. There's lots going on in the foreground. There's lots going on in the background. It's too much. It's hard to express. How do you manage that kind of uh, nozzle? Um, I will take basically the uh, um, 
uh, behavior that I will go back and listen to the thing. Um, hi there. Uh, I have a unstable internet connection. I'm going to reboot and rejoin. Bye. Bye. Good morning. Good morning. How is everyone? Uh, mostly good. Um, I don't know if you heard, Jerry, did you hear about uh, Bill Fenwick? Um, I got I, I got a note and uh, I hadn't heard before the note, but yeah. Yeah, we had a we had a kind of a memorial session of serious conversations last night. Oh, lovely. People shared, you know, their experiences of him. Yeah, it was it was. I thought I, those kind of things can <coughs> hurt, um, especially when they're spontaneous and, you know, whoever shows up. But I thought it. It, it worked pretty well. That's cool. He was a really interesting character. I mean, <laughs> was, yeah. my, my intersections with him were few, but really interesting. One of which was, I think he listened to a pitch by, by uh, one of uh, sort of a savant I met long ago named Sandy Klausner. Uh, mm -hmm. This is uh, Bill Fenwick has passed away of, of uh, oh. the law firm. Sorry to hear. Uh, uh, yeah. Um, and so, so Sandy had invented a thing called Cubicon, which was a visual program, programming language that went like from soup to nuts, could reinvent everything. And Fenwick very patiently heard him out, offered advice, et cetera, et cetera. He was like real, very menschy. And this was clearly off-roading uh, yeah. in, in other ways. And I've forgotten how the, how the event got set up, but, but uh, he seemed really nice. So I, I didn't have that many other interactions with Fenwick other than being in a, an audience with him or something like that or at some event. Um, do you want to say more about him, John? Well, wow. <laughs> we had a long, you know, he was, he was a kind of a, one of the founding members of uh, Serious Conversations. Mm. And uh, along with Doug, one of our uh, wise elders, I mean, we're all elders, you know, at this point, <laughs> wiser, more elder elders. And, um, you know, he, it was, it was, he was a lot to, lot to digest in, a, in an interesting way. He, he, he was very paced. He would, you know, he'd say, well, you know, and you, 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 your, your mind, when you first started hearing him would start going, oh, this is going to be one of these old stories about Kansas or something, you know, but then he would do this incredible weave where he would, you know, go around the barn and go through the constitution, <laughs> go through the fact that people uh, who's not telling the truth, you know, and, and how dire that is uh, for our future and, and so on. And it, 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 was a, it was quite an experience actually to, uh, to be in these sessions with him. Doug might have more to say um, about that because uh, there were many, many interactions between them. I don't know. Doug, do you wanna? Well, he, he was an amazing person. Yeah. And his humility coming out of a sharecropper background in the South. Mm -hmm. How he ever got to be Bill Fenwick is pretty amazing. Mm -hmm. And I also said, found myself saying last night that our society is pretty interesting if it allows a person like that to be successful. And when I say like that, I mean, Bill really was one of the most down to earth, humble people you could imagine. Um, he carried that sharecropper stuff with him with great dignity. Um, it was an interesting evening because it led to a reflection on what serious conversations was about, where he was so supportive for a long time. Yeah. And as one of the people said when they were talking, they said, if this was a normal conversation, I would have been interrupted. But part of serious conversations is that you let people finish what they're saying. But on in correspondence to that, it means since you're going to be heard, you should keep what you say fairly short. And that was the core of what serious conversations actually did. And Bill was uh, loved it uh, and was very supportive. Brought me into Fenwick and West a few times to talk to the staff uh, about that. Yeah. Love that. I'm so glad I didn't interrupt you in the middle of saying that, Doug. Would have been, would have been, would have been awkward. Right. Um, Although not to disrespect that at all, but um, what's her name? Um, oh, gosh. Sounds like? Sherry, Sherry Turkle. 
Yeah. Uh, did a piece yesterday about uh, about the cultural differences on interruptions, uh, and coined a phrase that was something like collaborative interruption. Uh, and you think about the dynamic of New York conversations are very different from the dynamic of you know Des Moines conversations. Uh, so it's not to disrespect what Doug's saying. I think the combination of, of listening to be fully heard and keeping what you say concise is a lovely frame for how to navigate that, maybe across different cultures. Culturally, it varies wildly. I mean, there are some cultures where it's just like, actually, actually in Latin America, um, and I don't know if this varies by country and in which countries, but very often if you're talking to somebody and they're not going, uh-huh, yeah, got it, uh-huh, yep, yep, uh-huh, back at you in the yeah. Spanish equivalents, yeah. uh, it's as if they're not listening. Yeah. So, so the little act back <clears throat> at, at different periods is culturally really significant. And those are kind of little interruptions, but, but they're important. R related diversion, I just saw, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't have the reference for it. <clears throat> I saw a piece recently, um, one of several I've come across that are very critical of oh. psychological, psychological research. Uh, saying that you know most of what we're seeing is being done with um, uh, white middle class American students um, in particular, so, you know, very narrow samples generalized very broadly to humanity in ways that are probably not appropriate. I'll see if I can find anything close to it. And it's also like most scientific studies were performed on white men, and like then like women were seldom the subject of studies. Oh, and and, yeah, and medical so. medical studies. <clears throat> To, and aside, aside from the fact that the, the experimental design itself is often, often shitty. Right, right. I think the Framingham Heart Study is like all men or something like that. I don't, I don't remember. But. They've, they've, they've broadened it over the years, but originally, yeah. Yeah, because it's like a longitudinal study that's like 40 years old, something like that. Yeah. And, it's, and it's the gold standard reference. For better or for worse. Exactly. Um, well, welcome, everybody. Uh, 1948, says my brain. Um, is when it started. Here we go. Um, so let's go about some checking of the ins. Um, Doug, do you want to check in? How about Doug Gill? <clears throat> well, I, it's a strange. It's such a strange time, um, and I keep being in meetings where people are trying to avoid the strangeness. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's not working very well. I mean, we are it, it, always in the past when there has been a social calamity of some kind, people had the feeling that they would get through it and the world they would then be in was the familiar world they had left before the calamity. Uh, that's not true with climate change. Uh, in fact, it looks like uh, given the way things are, things will continue to change for the worse uh, forever. And that means that the conditions for humans to get a foothold and make a culture are dwindling. So how do we handle that uh, as, as writers, as consultants, as uh, family members? Mm -hmm. It's just not at all clear uh, what to do. Uh, I find myself uh, these days, reading Arnold Toynbee and his wonderful 13 volumes on the collapse of 28 civilizations and finding it extremely useful and extremely well written to my surprise. Uh, that's just one of a number of things. Anyway, that's enough for now. Thanks, Doug. Um, one of the many interesting questions, I was in a really nice conversation with Ben Roberts yesterday and he said one of the things he's running into a lot is that his, his friends, people who he loves and who's, who he who works with, seem to be pretty evenly split. And I don't know if it's 50-50, but, but they're, they're split with the following thing. It's like, is capitalism fixable or not? Mm -hmm. And if you think it is, then you're trying to figure out how to fix it, what to do, et cetera, et cetera. And if you're not, you're like, well, we absolutely positively need an alternate system. And how do we get there? And that, that's a, it's a pretty big schism within people who are trying to fix things. Right, and, and it's a pretty straightforward question with all, very hard answers. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Gil. Yeah, I wasn't quite ready to check in, but I want to respond to a couple of things Doug says. Um, yeah, the strangeness is there. And um, 
and I, I noticed myself avoiding it as well as noticing other people avoiding it because it's so big. Uh, um, I think in part because it's not, you know, we, we talk about climate as the existential issue of our times, but it's way worse than that. Because, um, you know, the, the whole stack uh, is collapsing. It's, 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 it's climate for sure. It's pandemics, not as the COVID pandemic, but the pandemic era in which we can expect to see more of this. Uh, with probably continued inadequate human response. Uh, we have the um, you know, massive uh, disruption in ocean ecology. Uh, we have biodiversity collapse, 70% of insect species gone in North America and you know, start to think about the role of insects in ecosystems and what does that portend. Uh, Multi-decadal me mega drought in the West. This is not a drought that we're in now, it's something else than that. And so you, know, you go down the stat and you know, um, health status of human beings, relationship of all those things together. It's, you know, it's, it's an intertwingled mess of potential great seriousness of a sort that people can't really grasp. Um, and so Doug, I think the avoidance is not just the avoidance on climate, but on the looming suspicion that things are deeply, deeply unstable at kind of an epical historic scale. You know, we're, we're in a time I think that will be written about 200 years ago as one of these historic transition moments in human history. Um, and um, so there's that. Did I, I, I don't remember if I talked um, recently about the book uh, Beyond uh, Before European Hegemony. I think I, you mentioned it, yes. Yeah. Um, um, a really fascinating historical treatment of the like 1250 to 1350 before the rise of Europe as dominant force in the West. And there was a global system there. There was, you know, there's trade between Europe and India and China. There's profound, sophisticated global system of a sort that I sort of naively assumed wasn't there. Uh, and um, it, for me, it was a real eye-opener about the, um, the big sweeps of human history, um, how things change dramatically, um, how, you know, uh, we think of ourselves as, you know, sort of much more sophisticated than the ancients, and that ain't true. Um, and profoundly for me is a, was is not something she proposed, although actually you know, she wrote this in the 1980s and had a lot of insight about where we were going. Um, um, the, deeper, the deeper effect on me is a recognition or, or a perception that the last 70 or 100 years that we've lived in, which is a world of uh, you know, modernity and progress and uh, um, growing inclusion and internationalization and so forth is maybe a real anomaly in human history. And I, I, I recognize that I've lived my life assuming that this trajectory of progress is sort of the nature of things. And I'm now living more in a sense that the nature of things is, you know, it's a lot like that. And I don't know where we are on that curve. So Doug, I think that's part of the strangeness that's unspoken almost by anybody. I, you know, there's growing talk about climate, but very little about the, you know, the sort of the cascading strangeness of the whole thing. Um, on the split on capitalism, I'm very, interesting to, very interested to hear that from Ben, um, from his perspective. And I think that's there, not deeply sophisticated. Uh, in the world that I'm operating in, there's a lot of attempts at various kinds of reforming of capitalism, you know, maybe loosely under the title of stakeholder capitalism. Interestingly, the uh, the book uh, Net Positive just came out this week. Uh, Paul Pullman, former CEO of Unilever, and Andrew Winston, uh, one of the sustainability guru speakers guys. And uh, their, their advertising meme to lead the book launch is Milton Friedman is dead. And it's really still, not still dead. St still dead, but it's not just that his ideas were wrong headed and we need, we need to move past them. It was kind of a, a, a nice shocker. And um, so, you know, so the shift from the purpose of capitalism to maximize return to shareholders to the notion of the purpose of the business is to do what the business is there to do. And if it doesn't, well, it makes money is, is a shift that's rippling through the business world to some extent. But my challenge to all this is that there are, there are structural defects in capitalism that none of these reform efforts address. Nobody is facing up to the structural, what I, what I call the structural defects. I'm happy to talk about that more. Uh, at another point, there's five that I've identified, and uh, I don't see, you know, I see people nibbling at some of them, uh, but one which has to do with the um, the sharing of value, nobody talks about.
in 30 years of sustainability conferences I've heard it addressed once. Um, and it, it's profound and it goes to the root and we've got the Pandora papers this year is another example of that story. So I think the question of Jerry of um, how do we even take on that conversation is a very important one. Agreed. Um, <clears throat> before I dive into the eight things <clears throat> that you popped up in my head, there's some di there's a digital artifact on your audio gill that we're hearing a little like a little snap crackle pop going on. At first, I thought it was your microphone rubbing against your clothes, but it doesn't sound like that. It sounds more digital. Um, let me. That's really weird because it was. I, I heard that reported <clears throat> last week. I upgraded my Zoom and it went away. Oh. And um, it seems to be back, and I don't. And you're not you, you're not using your earbuds or anything like that. You're just talking over your laptop, right? Talking on my laptop. I've got a I've got a backup drive connected. Let me pull that out. But it ahead. sounds like some kind of artifact, like it, like a loose cable, or I don't. Pete, do you know how to? It, it sounds kind of like that, yeah. Yeah. Um, That's going to be inside my computer, which is not what I want to hear. Possibly. Yeah. Don't know. Uh, maybe it, we can figure out how to. A little more. It's a little more rhythmic or, or regular yeah. than a loose cable. That that's a kind of a oh. weird characteristic of it. That it's I'm, not, I'm not touching the computer. Is it is it uh, awesome. still happening now? Yeah, still going on. Yeah, I pulled the drive, so it's not that okay. So I'm gonna take I'm gonna have to take this in for an exam. Um well we, we can figure out how to try to isolate or something. It, anyway, it it sounds a little bit like uh gated noise, like something's making noise and something else is gating it actually. The maybe the Doug other is also unmuted. I'm not sure if it's Doug. Oh, um, uh, Doug, if you'll mute, we'll see if this uh, fine. Every, everybody, everybody except me mute. Let's see if it's still there. Yeah, I mean, thank you. Too. Okay, I'm, how's it now? Still, still present. Okay, I, well, I think it's related to when you speak. There's something that's that's well, yeah, being... yeah. So there's the gain in my speech, and something's clipping it. Yeah, yeah, but I'm hearing it even when when uh, Gil's not speaking. Um, I think I think it's just your connection is is uh, somewhere funky and. Uh, given that you're not using any gear, to, like you're just talking over your laptop, that's so strange because I would be checking your microphones or cables or plugs or whatever. <clears throat> so it sounds like, anyway, um, back to the content of what you said. Uh, uh, at the start of what you're talking about, it's like there's a whole bunch of assumptions that we make that life is getting so much more complicated now. And I'm like, you know, you drop one of us back a couple, uh, a couple centuries, drop us somewhere in the world and we wouldn't survive for very long. <clears throat> because what you had to know to stay alive uh, was a lot. Life was like life has always been pretty complicated, I think. And then there's this trope about how uh, humans are actually living much longer. Uh, and if you look at the stats, uh, kind of, but like you can find old people way back when. It's just that things killed us off. Birth was very dangerous. Like uh, maternal mortality was high, infant mortality was high. But once you made it to like 50 years old, you could cruise and, and there were, you know, they're, they're finding lots of skeletons who were old. So it's, there's this notion that, that I guess, because science hygiene, et cetera, and, and so forth, we're just ex extending human life forever. We have old people from way back when it's just that we've gotten better at, at keeping us alive. Yeah. There's a bunch of stuff like that in the background. And then, and then what to do about the future, I think is, is a giant thorny hairball. <clears throat> And um, uh, you know, climate change, geoengineering. I read a good essay um, a couple of days ago by a scientist who basically says, "Hey, look, I'm all about carbon capture, but really, we're probably going to need some large-scale geoengineering to cause some some quicker changes." And the unintended consequences of of like yanking on the geoengineering chain in some big way are completely frightening to me. Um, completely like I agree on completely frightening. I think the the assertion that it's that it's the only way out is a very very debatable. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so so and, and what I would see that as I, I see the the geoengineering story as an expression of that old line that if your only tool is hammer, you tend to see all problems as nails. Um, yeah, except I'm, I'm hearing I'm hearing votes for geoengineering from people who aren't otherwise like only got this hammer like like it's it's not just you know um people like that so uh, and and the problem with geoengineering is that you're experimenting on a global scale uh you know lots of other things you can experiment on a small scale and and just to point out how these things go sideways really quickly <clears throat> Mao Zedong's for pest campaign back during the cultural revolution in China 
one of the pests was sparrows. So everybody in China went out and clapped and, you know, <clears throat> shooed the sparrows until the sparrows sort of all died. So they got rid of sparrows in China. And it turns out the sparrows were eating the insects. You get this huge uptick in insects who have no more predators, really, or fewer predators. Uh, and all of a sudden, there's a famine. Uh, yeah, and and mil yeah. millions of people die. Millions of people die from, from a human-created meme of uh, or command actually, hey, let's go out and kill, you know, get rid of the, the sparrows. Insane. That was a good idea at the time. Yeah, it yeah, looked like a good idea at the time. Got the old story about parachuting cats into Borneo, and you know, there's countless examples of that. In the British Raj, in the early days of the British Raj, there were lots of cobras across India, so the, the British put a bounty on cobras. And they're like, okay, let's catch the cobras. And it turns out people start raising cobras to cash in bounties. Of course. Um, <clears throat> yeah, exactly. Pete is listing a bunch of them. <clears throat> and, and I'm actually worried. All, all of which have in common <clears throat> um, simplistic or mechanistic interventions in complex systems. Yep. And I'm getting worried every time I go outside and I don't get bothered by, by bees and flies. And every time I drive somewhere and I don't get bugs on the windshield, I'm like, oh, that seems really bad too. Uh, so anyway, anybody else want to chime in on, on the, the many crises and how to, how to sort of settle in and approach them together? Before we do, I just want to say one other thing about the geoengineering. Um, it's another example of a simplistic intervention into complex systems, number one. Number two, it's the way that the existing forces make money. Uh, because, you know, it's, it's hard for Bechtel to make money on a Klaus major approach to agriculture. You know, it's going to be decentralized, place-based, and da, da, da. It's much easier to make money on pouring megatons of concrete all over the world. So that structure is there. And one of the, I think one of the great characteristics of capitalism is that it's phenomenally adaptive and can change without changing. And geoengineering is one of a number of approaches to climate that say, let's, you know, let's change and deal with this, with this threat, but with changing as little about our existing system and the causality that's given rise to this as possible. So, end of rant. Thanks, Gil. Uh, Mark. To to push back against the notion that um, discomfort is unexpressed. I rather have seen it throughout my lifetime as discomfort from marginal populations is unheard. Mm -hmm. And it's also attempted to be silenced. Now, you know, this is not a victim narrative that I'm trying to promote. It's the you know, what I have seen in the world. I, I believe that these messages have been here for a hell of a long time. Um, just don't know that they are being taken up um, and amplified in a capitalist media milieu. And to build on that, Mark, if you look back on lots of catastrophic events, before the events, there's generally a a few people who are saying, this is going to happen. This is going to happen. This is going to happen. Everybody, hey, hey, hey. And nobody's listening to them. Um, and then, you know, and for some reason, we don't go back and examine the, the, the Cassandras very much at all. Uh, but, and they're, they're lost in the wave of other things that people are saying or the other crisis that mask the, the, the coming crisis. So I have to ask if sense making includes making the sense of being ignored. Oh, totally. I'm making the sense I, of being listened I, to and, and, and how to, you know, make a sense of populations around the world to be unsilenced. I think absolutely. Mark, you, you, I, I like how you called it marginalized populations because you talk to anybody in any of those and they'll say, yeah, of course, that's the reality we live with every day. You know, ranging from the, the, the critics saying, you know, Jerry, I, told, I tell you this is going to happen you know, to the maid in your hotel room who you never even see, even when she's there, you know? Um, the people of the swamps of Nigeria who basically have had uh, their, their ancestral land poisoned by mobile shell, um, Arco, you know, it's just, uh, it's a global thing that I would rather try to highlight that we have a system which is making the sense and the communication of, hey, gas prices, woo, rather than Indonesian peasants being thrown off their land, um, 
uh, whole cultures being um, silenced and forgotten because of it's so easy to drive a bulldozer into a place that has oil. I, you know, not sure how to look at that in a systems communication perspective. Um, but I do know it's not, you know, it's not the kind of conceptual structures of John Soa and, you know, the types of systems thinkers that you get to until, you know, uh, Barry Commoner in the 70s and uh, I mean, even in the 40s, the cybernetics um, uh, Macy conferences are, are talking about this, but more in the 70s and basically how we just don't we're not able to see or communicate clearly circular chains of logic and causation in ways that affect human behavior at a large scale. I, I don't have a solution. Mark, when you say we, are you talking about humans? Are you talking about the modern West? Good question. Um, and the honest answer is I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. I either. do not know if for example, how to say <laughs> the extinction of the woolly mammoth and the non-extinction of the buffalo on the plains until the white people came, or, you know, sorry to, sorry, sorry to use the white people kind of label, but, you know, until, you know, the advents of trains and guns. Um, to I, be, want, I want to invite us to be careful about the white people because yes, the, white people, the white people are, you know, Western European capitalist white people. And there's, you know, you can probably find a lot of depth, you know, I mean, the African empires engaged in the slave trade of their own, you know, melanin, you know, hued people. So, um, I, I, yeah, I just want to advise caution there. Agree completely. I tried to eat back the words yeah, as they were coming out. The mess is good. And, you know, the, the Macy conferences were a goldmine. Uh, Mary Catherine Bates' book, Our Own Metaphor, is a great window into what you're talking about. My absolute favorite book. If I could pay some everybody $100 to read that book, I would. We'll take up a fund, Mark. <laughs> But, you know, but the line goes back before that it goes, you know, Rachel Carson in the early 60s and work in the 40s and uh, uh, um, um, Sir Albert Howard Agricultural Testament in what 1910 or 1900 or something like that, which was the roots of organic agriculture and back before that and then indigenous practice going back centuries and eons. So there are things that we've, you know, what's that old line I've forgotten more than you'll ever know. So there's that in our history. We have, we have experiences of living. Uh, the way that I'm thinking about it lately is um, you know, trying to get away from this notion of managing nature better and being nicer to nature. And some people say, no, no, we are nature. It's like, how do we, how do we live as though we belonged to the living world? Um, I'd like, like to make a, uh, a, a slight nudge yeah. that we uh, are careful about uh, airtime and giving space for other voices. Absolutely. I'll be quiet. I'm just gonna, th I'm just gonna throw something in the chat for future. You just muted yourself, Gil. I'm sorry, I'm gonna throw something in the chat for future reference, not for today. Thank you, Doug. Cool. Gil, do you wanna check in? <laughs> not after what Doug just said. <laughs> um, uh, Two, I'd like to check in. Uh, let, let me get to you in just a second. Two things I wanted to add in. One, to what you said. One, ironically, the lawyer that actually cornered Chevron and won a case against Chevron for screwing up Nigeria is on, has been under house arrest for two years. Uh, and, and like weird, weird, weird things are happening in that case. And then what, what, what ends up happening when people are not heard is you get tropes like defund the police. And, and for me, defund the police is a natural response to uh, attempts of police reform a whole there's there have been like generations decades of attempts to fix how policing works that haven't worked and so the latest thing is like let's just take away their budget so defund the police which is a and i and i think defund the police is a gold mine for the far right they're like oh awesome they gave us a they gave us a trope to go to go like light on fire let's do that same thing with critical race theory, which is an academic discipline. It's like, hey, let's pull this thing out of the dark corners of academe, light it on fire in the public sphere and get all of our people pumped up, right? And, and the right is really, really skilled at this, deeply skilled at this. 
at, at lighting in, and, and at putting these fires and making sure that the dumpster, dumpster is hot enough and smoky enough that it's really hard to concentrate on other kinds of stuff that are actually more important. And as a database developer, I know how to automate this stuff so you can find the, the thing that's on fire to focus on. I mean, basically, this is what uh, artificial intelligence and social uh, networks have been able to give us is finding those um, toxic messages faster and making them more toxic. Woo! Hooray for software developers. <laughs> Exciting. Um, okay, so let's go back to check-ins. Let's go Mark, Stacy, uh, Michael. Hi, good morning, or at least good morning here. Um, I've got great news. I uh, had a uh, test at LabCorp on Monday um, for my response to the booster of Moderna. And so I have not been yet exposed to the coronavirus by um, testing those antibodies, but my antibody response to the Moderna vaccine um, Four weeks after the two shots was 36 per milliliter. Um, about six months after that, right before the booster, it was four um, per milliliter, which is terrible. Um, or at least, you know, they don't really know. Uh, but what they do know is um, uh, my response that I got um, a couple of days ago is over 2,500 per milliliter, which is as good as it gets. So my B cells are back, baby. And, um, uh, you know, uh, living as a cancer survivor is a label that I'm not used to. Um, and it's kind of uh, not one I encourage. Um, I would love to be at the Internet Archive a artist in residence, but I wouldn't want to be called that. I just want to be that, do that, belong in that role. And um, that's kind of uh, a direction that I'm choosing to investigate much more strongly. I thrive on the ability to speak and have the experience of speaking and listening to work out problems. And boy, have I not had that in, you know, the, you know, since 1984, attempting to work on the foundation, scientifically, mathematically, of, of semiotics. Basically, every thought is a sign. Every communication is a sign. What is a sign? How do signs work? What is a digital sign? And so I'm starting to write this stuff up. Um, as I could have a long, long time ago, but damn, do I need to talk in order to write? Or at least, let me put it simply, I'm lazy. I can write it down. It's just such a pain in the ass that when I am able to engage, and thank you, uh, Pete, and the talk with Mark Antoine, and you know, every once in a while, John, and uh, once with Julian, and certainly, uh, Gil, Stacy, Jerry, Michael. Yeah, we, we got to talk more. That is what I'm attempting to do. Not only write everything down that everybody says in order to say, aha, here is an utterance by a person at a particular time in a particular context. And how can I collect billions of these things and see how they interact? But um, how can I make that explanation so that I don't have to do this alone. I don't have to do this poor. You are in the right crowd for that quest, if I just may point out. It may be frustrating as hell, but yeah. but I think that I think that is like top dead center for where we're aiming. Cancer is um, so frustrating, you know. <laughs> Stopping smoking is frustrating, you know. There's just there's a lot of frustration here. <laughs> Gil, go ahead. Um <clears throat> Mark talking is fine and there, you know, it's getting automatically transcribed and maybe what we need to do is hire a modern Mary Catherine Bateson to take these OGM conferences and edit them into a series of artifacts. No, Pete, I've never seen that, Pete. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> it's a thing. Um, I, transcription, external transcription is great and, and Winnie and I 
Winnie Elford and I do a lot of talking about that. There's no reason not to have people like co-creating text while we're we're co-creating speech. No reason in this day and age uh, with the folks here who can do text. Oh, so I misread that. I thought that was an I thought that was an opposite of that. I that it is. An it is. That, yeah. That's like I don't yeah. really agree. Oh, I thought you just did did though. Okay. Um, external transcription, I, it's, it's got its place. Um, and uh, Wendy Elford is a virtuoso with taking clean text, as she says, and doing amazing stuff with it. Um, in a group like this, there's no reason for us to need a third party to be doing transcription. Well, no, let me, let me, let me clarify then. The, the transcription, Otter does the transcription. Mary Catherine Bateson, may her, you know, may her soul travel, travel well. Somebody who is smart and is sensitive in the realms that we're talking about that could curate and edit and distill you know, gorgeous readable text or Jerry um, last we, week. Other we can do that. We can artists. do that instead of Otter and we can do that instead of Mary Bateson. Cool. And we should. And, and, and we're not. And because we're lazy. And let's do that. So that's my point is not how we do it, but let's do that. There is gold in these conversations. It would be a great gift to many other people who aren't part of this. Gil, so can you pick like a past conversation or maybe like each of us can pick, you know, because there's plenty of there's plenty of content out there to. I would, I would I would bat that back to Jerry Mikulski, who knows what's where. I've heard of this guy. Um, so I would actually like to sort of soften the thing we just talked about and say hey i would love to encourage anyone who feels in so moved to go take any point that we've been talking about and express it in any medium that is comfortable to them and share it back in here so that we can weave it into the big fungus and lather rinse repeat and if we do this a lot one of us will turn out to be the mary Catherine bateson looking back 100 years from now um, and it'll be a member of our community who stood up and started writing like sensible streams that we were a lot like that, that voice, that, that set of insights, that set of connections, that narrative string through a series of things that we've stumbled across in our conversations. That's the one. Jerry, who uh, would like, to, who would like to be the patron? So for, I'm, so I think OGM is a container for it. I think that weaving the world, uh, the podcast that I'm, that I'm starting is a, is a, is a vehicle for it exactly. And I'm trying to find those people and create my own narrative through some of these things. And I've put out a, a bunch of basically uh, brain screencasts or me talking head sort of things about some of the narratives that I believe in. And they're, they're on YouTube and, you know, they get like a couple dozen views. Um, but I think that us sort of doing this together in different ways and then intersecting. And, and one of the experiments I'm really interested in, in, in holding is how do we write in a modular way so that, you know, for me, a book is a playlist of chapters. And chapters are sort of playlists of nuggets of ideas that are strung together in a way that makes pretty continuous sense as, as serial prose. Um, but could we leave our books in places like GitHub so that my chapter three becomes your chapter six and then Pete's chapter two becomes your chapter five. And then you write chapters one through four and then append a conclusion and you write a book and we all publish a book that have these overlapping narratives where we start to agree on what some of these nuggets are. And we like, it would be really interesting to publish 20 simultaneous books by simultaneous, I mean, within the same two year period, let's call it. But it'd be really interesting to write 20 simultaneous books that, that lean on the same ideas and build together, but take different perspectives, represent different audiences, different affected parties, invite in other people to look through this, this series of nuggets and compose their own, uh, however that might be. I think that would be like super interesting. And, and, a woven community set of books uh, where the books are just souvenir artifacts where in fact the interesting stuff is happening in in the fungus in 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 the context that we're all sort of feeding off of and, and, and nourishing uh, could get attention i don't know i'm interested and that that's kind of uh, that's a place where i think uh i'm trying to head uh, the question is who else is interested and who else wants to do this i mean uh, I don't. I don't know who else wants to take visual notes of meetings like this, right? I do. I'm busy feeding my brain along the way, and I don't know who else is compelled to do so. And I'm. I'm looking for those people. I'm, I'm just really eager to find those people and then to to take notes with them. I'm so eager do to. Be, do they need to be compelled to do so, or could they be hired to do so? Motivated, personally motivated, and it, it, I'd be fine finding funds for them. That's that's no problem with that. But if they don't have an intrinsic like yeah. like impulse to do it I, I think hiring them and trying to describe what the thing is is hard and not as fruit not nearly as fruitful as somebody with a passion and the and the talent 
I think there are a lot of people who have those skills who would love to do that, but it's a big, it's a big ask we're asking of them. Um, actually, um, I think we, you know, the, the old joke, how do you eat an elephant, right? One bite at a time, that's it. We just take a bite and, and a, take a tiny bite. And then if the bite is good and tasty, like take more bites and bring some other people in and teach them how to eat that way or whatever it is, I don't know. But, but I have a feeling that one of the things that's lying right in front of us is to help reinvent how media works and how it's used in the world because we're still stuck in a world of, of books and songs that are protected and intellectual property over protection and a bunch of other stuff. We're not actually using humans' ideas well. Um, and many of us have blogs and stuff like that. Doug just posted his Substack pub uh, uh, in the chat. Like, like that's a good, good start. We've got you know, opinions out there. Any, anyone else want to throw in on this? Yeah, I'll use it as my check-in. Um, Sounds great. I know I've said a few times that I'm really interested in the post-production part, and this is actually why. I'm kind of hoping that it will be a vehicle to try out new things in terms of engagement. And to Mark's point, I think working with other people at the same time is really helpful, at least for some of us. I mean, I, I can remember writing entire papers just sitting across. We actually wrote every single word together. You know, it was like finishing sentences or the next sentence. And that was so productive. It was just like flowing. Um, on, on a separate note, though, I, I also want to say, because it came up with the thing about capitalism, because something I was thinking about a lot this morning is I'd love to hear a conversation from people that understand more about this whole new thing about like Main Street investing. Like there's an app and, you know, I look into some of the projects that are on it where they're trying to, you know, they're trying to collect from the community so that it goes back into the community. And I see so many young people, you know, investing like, you know, a few hundred dollars here and there. And I'm just wondering, I'd like to hear from people that have a little bit more knowledge about what they think of that, you know, at some point. And that's it. Thanks, Stacy. Anyone want to offer thoughts on that? Good. Um, let's go, Michael, John, Mark. Um, hello. On, on the subject um, of the right being really good at finding things, um, uh, like defund the police and critical race theory, et cetera. Um, I just wanted, my, my reaction was, boy, you know, the left is really good at to, and You just broke up on us, Michael. Knows that outrage, oh, oh sorry. Um, I'll, I'll write at the good words too. Um, at the words we wanted to hear. Can you just repeat the last couple sentences? you know, good journalists, well, I, I won't say good journalists, but, um, but journalists who know where, which side their bread is buttered on right now, um, and, you know, we're talking clicks, know that outrage is a draw, and the amount of um, ink slash pixels expended on inconsequential actions by Donald Trump now, or, you know, this outrageous behavior by this one person, you know, doing something on a street in the deep South, you know, that playing that to the coastal left is gonna get you clicks and it's one of the big things that is wrong with the algorithmic feed that, you know, that knows that outrage um, gets clicks and how to defuse that. Um, I mean, you know, I think, I think not having algorithmic feeds um, or not having externally controlled algorithmic feeds and not having um, advertising supported engagement driven media as our source of information is a big part of that but boy the 
the whole the whole cycle of whatever you click on whatever people click on in general a lot of humans um, you know pete to your <laughs> to your look comment in the um the thread you know some humans are really bad about clicking on stuff that outrages them and making sure that there is a lot more outrage porn out there for all of us and yes yes gil journalists um <laughs> is is very true i don't know if that's your coinage but it it's good <laughs> um uh yeah, and um, when we click, we vote, and and everybody has to realize that you know there you know when we click on stuff, there is going to be more of it. And I, I notice in my Apple News feed that um, Vanity Fair, you know, which is not really known for their political, you know, minute by minute commentary, has gotten in the habit of putting up these, you know, clickbaity, um, snarky um, bits about the latest thing that Giuliani ha has done or um, a, uh, you know, a Trump family member. And it is, it's, it's very difficult not to click on. And the more you do, the more of that there is and the more outrage, you know, I, I don't know what the what the fuel is in outrage for, for all of us. I don't think any of us are immune to it, you know, that discovering something awful that somebody did makes me better for knowing, you know, I'm more righteous because I know how wrong they are. Um, and engagement, you know, attention selling and engagement, you know, surveillance, capitalism, attention economy, whatever you want to call it, diffusing that is a big part of it, but that's something that's driving it and driving division. Um, and I, I, I think to point fingers at the right for doing it, you know, Fox got really good at it, maybe sooner than MSNBC did, but you know, I will not accept that, that, um, that in some ways, you know, Rachel Maddow is even better at it than Sean Hannity, because it's a little less transparent. Um, and, you know, Huffington Post is great at it, and Vanity Fair is great at it, and it's, it's everywhere. Sorry, end of rant. Um, not really a check-in, just a point. Um, that sounded very check-in-y. What's that? That sounded very check-in-y. It was good. Okay. Yeah. No All worries. Right. Uh, hold on, I'm just chatting something and I didn't, didn't want to lose that in my brain. Um, let's go, John, Mark, Julian. Okay, so I'm, this is, I'm gonna focus on, in a way on post-production and in a way on um, <coughs> different metaphors, different organizational frameworks beyond the ones we're talking about. Um, and I'll, I'll mention two. Um, in the 80s, I taught something called information mapping, uh, which is Bob Horn's work. Uh, probably, you know, Jerry knows it well, probably a bunch of you know it well. Not a, what, what are now kind of a lot of obvious sounding ideas about advanced organizers and labels. Um, you know, good stuff. It's, it's had its life and it's gotten and subsumed and it doesn't really directly translate into the land of clickability, but I think there's a potential, particularly for a podcast, for uh, use of an advanced organizer as, a, um, as an intro, outro, more of an intro than an outro. And I have this, I have an audio vision, let's say, okay? And the audio vision of the, is of the, an opposite gender voice stating the label for the next chunk of speech just before it begins. So, you know, you, you, you produce this thing and you, okay, you, you see where this is going and someone looks at it and they say, oh, well, that's actually the, the summary, isn't it? Or that's actually the, you know, or, or, or it's a question. It's a question that the, the podcast text answers. So an opposite gender voice, if the podcaster is male, the opposite gender voice would be female, does the, 
uh, does the audio soft version of the audio question just before the audio voice continues. I, this is all in my imagination. I haven't done this, you know, but I mean, I just, it just sounds to me like something interesting I would like to explore um, as a way to uh, up, tune up the uh, podcast model because there's so many podcasts that you got to, we got to do something to distinguish it. And um, did you ask a question, Jerry, before? I was just going to say that. Um trying to create an environment where lots of experiments like what you just described can take place is a good thing. And I think that like trying, trying out different modes and I'm remembering uh, an old piece of Apple software. I thought it was an Apple project where some story would be being told there was a narrative going on and there were three avatar heads basically at the side of the screen that represented three different kinds of characters. And they would kind of, they were your guides and they would hold up their hand kind of virtually when they thought they had something that was relevant to say to the, to the present narrative. And then if you, click, if you clicked on them, if you chose to follow their hand raised, um, they would then say, well, here's, here's my view on what's happening right here. Uh, and it was kind of a hyper texty kind of thing. I don't remember what the name of the project was, but it, but it was one such experiment long ago. Yeah. So that's just something to play with in the future, perhaps. And a related thing, I cannot do the, I can't do a, a satisfying job of the real time I can, I can take notes, I can take notes that are a summary, but I'm not really capturing things about the structure that I, of what's happening. I need to sort of step back and digest. And for several years, I was part of a project where we really stepped back and we really had a team and we really drilled down on uh, interview results. And we, because we had this, this condition, we said, we're gonna go interview people we're not going to publish that we will have the notes for ourselves. We're not going to publish the notes. What we're going to do is we're going to translate the notes into newspaper stories from the future. If the person we're interviewing is correct. And if the person we're interviewing is completely wrong. And that was a, you know, that was an interesting discipline. Um, you know, you'd have to put some good heads together and you'd have to really crank, but you know, it, I mean, so they got a couple of days of work, but then you'd wind up with this wall. You, you, do, you do 15, 20 interviews, four or five days of work, a team of three, and now you have a wall with 150 newspaper stories on it. Each newspaper story, five to seven words, two sentences, and a date. A date is right on the edge of pl plausibility. Now that was going toward, toward the particular goal. It was going towards bottoms up interactive scenarios. You wouldn't keep all those conditions, you know, you'd keep the things that work, like make it short, make it modular. You don't need the date. I mean, you might need the date. You might even, but the, the whole point I'm making is you put a couple of minds together and they look at a, a, a discursive thing, you know, a thing that happened, an event, a, a flow. And they, and then you, and then you ask the question, if some of these people who are speaking are correct, what does the newspaper look like? What are five newspaper headlines for five years from now? If some of these people who are speaking are completely wrong, what are five newspaper headlines for five years from now? Is that an interesting um, addition? Does that actually add value to the to the thing? I don't know. I, you know, you have to do the experiment and see. I'm I'm kind of curious about what it yeah. will look like. But uh, I, I, in the same vein, I wonder whether you know the sci apocalyptic science and climate fiction movies, for example do they just dull us or do they help light this thing up? So, you know, if there's going to be a tidal wave over Manhattan and we'll all be living underwater, that movie got done. Didn't, didn't seem to wake us up. So, so like, like really what's it going to, what, what's it going to take? If I can, there's an, there is an answer from our experience. We, we developed when we were doing this, it's, it was called future mapping. We were doing it with uh, two different companies. We had some rules. We said, no kidnapping Bill Gates. And that was just a metaphor. I mean, no, no, and, no unless, no killing unless, baby FEMA, Hitler. unless FEMA is the client, no earthquakes, no tidal waves. And then we had the, the opposite when he said no Santa Claus events, you know, where it's something just, oh, magical new technology provides, no, 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 it, it doesn't work. And instead we went the other direction. We said, who's the client? Who's, who's the person acting or not acting in this space? Who are they? It, it, let's let's have them be the actor or they're the person they're afraid of be the actor their competitor 
So, or we could say company X, and then they can answer the question, are you company X or is somebody else? We'd say company X had a fire in their battery plant. So it's not the tidal wave. It's the whoops, oh yeah, batteries are, you know, and it's these, these little, you know, these little incremental whoops things, but concatenated together. And then you say, oh, oh, okay, um, yeah. You know, so you, for instance, you'd write uh, sat geoengineering satellite, um, you know, data from geoengineering satellite strongly conflicts, <laughs> you know, science plans or something like that. I don't know, you know, but, but see, the, this is what you want. You do not want geoengineering satellite uh, focuses sunlight and, and incinerates town. You know, that's, you don't want that. I'm just to earth killing uh, right. Tucker Carlson. Yeah, right. Yeah. I mean, that's that people go, ah, you know, th th you get that you get the uh, rubbernecking effect. He was, oh, I want to read that. It's like clickability, you know, but then they say, oh, well, I'm glad that's not going to happen. Creativity shuts off. What you want is, oh, oh, that that could happen. And that would have both positive and negative effects. Hmm. Eh. You know, so you want it, you want to mobilize the the drama completion part of the brains of the people who are experiencing it. <coughs> they then have to go ahead and do something with it. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, Doug, we you had your hand up a little earlier and then we I we whipped on by. Do you want to jump in for a sec? And I I'm no, gonna move, I'm, 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 uh, I'll I'll come back in later. Okay, cool. So let's go um, Mark, Julian, Pete. And I'm still here, I just have to shift. Yeah, good morning, everyone. Um, my, my checking is, uh, I'm, I'm super excited to announce that my um, Amazon project, Nativian has been selected as one of um, 15 top innovation by the World Economic Forum and the one trillion tree challenge. So no, I didn't expect that. Was that about my, my check-in? That's all I wanted to share. Well, I've been listening to every, everybody's uh, um, contribution today. Could you um, link to that, please, Mark? Sure, Thank here you. we go. Forgot to press that. Um, yeah, to 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 what uh, was listening to what you were saying, Gil, yeah, about um, geoengineering and you know biodiversity and all this good stuff. It's it really feels like it always we always throwing something um, in front of us and and trying to catch it like little dogs, you know, um, looking at solutions that do not exist today betting that they will be in place at the right time when we desperately need them. And it's, it's, um, it's always something that I've, I've, I've been struggling with. Um, but, you know, we've seen, uh, we've seen so many of these before. Mark, can you describe a little bit more of the Tilling Trees Project and how what you're doing fits and just to give us a little more texture again? Yes, of course. Um, so, you know, this is a um, um, UN decade for United Nations decade for um, restoring and protecting biodiversity. So, um, to my surprise, um, the World Economic Forum has been looking at this, and um, one of their um, I think I think really important um, criterion to 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 select projects was to put indigenous people at um, at the table, and um, so that's that's the the, the surprise part. Um, so my project itself is um, to um, it, it aims at preserving um, and reviving traditional knowledge around medicinal plants other way not only to keep um, traditional knowledge uh, relevant but also to offer a model um, for which it is it, we add values throughout uh, the the process and we put indigenous people basically in a in a position to assess their traditional knowledge in a modern context 
So it comes with, you know, of course, products, um, but also uh, um, learning exchange and, and creativity in terms of what do you want to do with that? Um, so it's based in Ecuador um, and mostly working with Quechua communities, which um, have um, designed a, a, a living plan and in which they want to ban all extractive economies and develop a, a forest-based bioeconomy. Um, that comes and, and fits into, into this living plan. It's called uh, um, um, Cossack Sasha, which means the living forest. Um, uh, do you have any links to it, etc.? I, I just posted a link oh, okay. there, and uh, also posting the uh, announcement right there. Um, yeah, some part of 15 other organizations. And we had the first call this morning to get to know each other. Very, very exciting. There is uh, Amazon 4.0 with uh, Carlos and Ismail Nobre. Uh, probably some of you have heard before. But so again, you know, an effort to um, value the Amazon outside the extractive industries. Sounds, sounds great. Um, and you're reminding me of where this conversation kind of started and the power dynamics of what got us here between the, the huge narratives in our heads and the, the, the punctuated equilibrium of changes and just how, uh, how some companies basically have dictated so much of what happens around the world. I mean, uh, there's a whole story about bananas and uh, the banana king uh, in Central America and the Great White Fleet and all of that. And uh, there's a whole story about oil in Western Africa and all that. And then you can just sort of, uh, somebody who doesn't need to know a lot of history can just drop around the world and talk about just like brutal, brutal crises worldwide uh, because resources, right? And then every time, every time I pass a, a Banana Republic store. And I used to get Banana Republic when it was a paper catalog of surplus goods. And I think I bought like a pair of old Gurkha shorts from them long ago. And then every time I passed the, the store, I flinch a little bit because, you know, we called them Banana Republics because we turned them into Banana Republics, like single source countries. Really great, right? For whose benefit? Well, not theirs. Not theirs at all. Anyway, sorry to, to be a little dark and gloomy, but I am in the dark forest now, so it seems to fit. <laughs> um, anyone else with thoughts about this? Uh, it's, it's, it's just different uh, than the uh, one tree and tree or um, the one you posted, the tree and tree campaign. Yep. This one is a one tree and tree challenge, and I posted the link. Yes, in fact, well. in fact, the one t.org is under the link that I sent in my brain. So they're, they're kind of connected. Yeah. yeah. And I think, and I had to look around to figure out, wait, is this different initiatives? Are they connected? And I think they're sort of connected. Uh, and the thing I don't get enough feedback on is, hey, this thing you got in your brain is actually backwards or upside down and doesn't work that way. So if, it, if I got it wrong, let me know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, for for me, really, what's what's uh, the, the the learning? I really didn't expect to be selected, to be honest, and and uh, mostly because it's a indigenous led uh, initiative. It's not something that comes, you know, from the, um, well known and quote unquote respectable people. Um, and and I was quite surprised to hear that um, you know they they really want to. Um, to work with indigenous communities around around you know preserving their resources and the culture and and um, the system that has sustained them for for thousands of years. So um, it's um it's both exciting and at the same time a little bit scary. Mm, I bet um, sounds good. Uh, Doug, did you want to jump in? Yeah, I uh, think listening to the whole conversation this morning, I find myself thinking. Given human nature with our randiness and our intelligence, 
that it was inevitable we were going to end up in this stuck place with an overpopulation and too much technology. And now that we're here, there's no way out. It was inevitable and we're here and there's no way out. Thought. So I'm just going to order a good lunch with my device and uh, keep, keep looking for limbic uh, rewards. Doug, that's a surprise. <clears throat> Surprising assessment from a futurist and scenarist. <laughs> well, it is a future scenario. It is. Well, it's a future scenario. Yeah. Well, it's of also, course, I have, I have other scenarios in mind. Yeah. Uh, but I think the fact that, that it was inevitable that we were going to create a too complex society with too many people dependent on fossil fuels. Mm -hmm. What if there was actually, there was no way to get off that track? Um, and I'm not sure that fossil fuel, like there was a point early in the automobile where cars were going to be electric. Mm -hmm. And then we discovered oil in Pennsylvania and then a bunch of other things happened behind some curtains <laughs> I don't, I'm not privy to, but we ended up with internal combustion engines as the, the way for locomotion, which is now, and this could have been just a long detour that screwed up the earth in a thousand ways. And now we seem to be going back to batteries, right? Well, at, uh, that, but, at that time, fossil fuels offered much greater energy density than anything electricity could muster. Did I'm, not, I'm not so sure. Uh -huh. no, no, really, because batteries, battery technology hasn't improved. Like, like the old lead acid battery was really pretty, pretty darn good and has been around forever. Um, and electric motors have been pretty good. We've gotten much better at micro motors. We've gotten much better at motor technology. But motors, once, once we started figuring motors out, motors are good. And like a car that's electric has many fewer moving parts is much simpler. Sure. Sure. There's a bunch of other good things. So we, so we got the story about how fossil fossil fuels kicked out public transportation in the 1940s. It would be interesting to see if there were similar moves in the early part of the century. Uh, into just what you're talking about, I don't know. So in the litany of bad corporate stories that I was talking earlier, I, was, I, I would then add the great American streetcar conspiracy, which is the, the story behind what you just said. And yeah. whoever, for whoever doesn't know that, uh, the, the movie Who Framed Roger Rabbit is actually based on facts. Gem of a movie. It's a fabulous movie. It's just like a artistic and everything. It's really it's also, it's also a great example of how the left might communicate more effectively than the right, not by trying to emulate Sean Hannity, but by doing something really imaginative, creative, and engaging of humans in a way that movie was. Right. Um, let's go, Julian, Pete, then me. Oh, and I think Julian just stepped away. Julian's back. No, I clicked the wrong button. Oh, you clicked the wrong button. Okay, good. And you're not uh, wearing your eye patch, so that's good. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> as elucidation, I missed the call last week because at eight o'clock last Thursday, I was having my eye sliced open. And I can tell you it is such a joy to be able to see with two eyes again, not these colored blobs that were coming in. It's uh, a magnificent, it's almost like I'm 20. Uh, Mark, I, I love this project of, of more trees. I've been doing my own part here in my little plot of Palo Alto, but more trees, more trees. Um, <clears throat> my check-in is that I'm in the middle of, uh, I have three conferences coming up, so I'm in the middle of trying to revise all my software. Consequently, everything is broken at the moment. Uh, I've been wrestling with Unity and Neo4j for some time, but it should all be done back together within two weeks, which is my deadline. The third conference looks pretty nice. It's in Pisa and uh, never been to Italy. Uh, the trouble is it's 2021 and I should say the server is in Pisa. I'll be attending from my desk as usual. Mm. Uh, so that's the extent of my check-in is that I'm rebuilding software and would have something to show again within two weeks. Sweet. Um, <clears throat> Mr. Kaminsky. Um, thank you, Jerry, and thank you all. Um, uh, we've had some great conversations in Massive Wiki Wednesdays, for what it's worth. Uh, Tuesdays at 5 p.m. Pacific and Mondays, or sorry, Wednesdays at 9 a.m. Pacific. Um, uh, find the times in the Massive Wiki channel. Uh, if you get Mark Carranza and Wendy Elford uh, and, and or Bill Anderson uh, chatting about the philosophy of uh, information and 
thought and something like that. It's a trip, total trip. Um, uh, uh, I wanted the, the main thing I wanted to talk about today was actually something I posted in Off Topic Channel. Um, it's an interview with Alan Kay from 2017. Um, and uh, I think most of the most of the folks in OGM would would find this really interesting. Um, uh, the the headline is that he's you know so Alan Kay, uh, inventor of the Dino book. What do you think of the iPhone um, or the iPad? Um, and that's you know that's it's interesting to to hear what you think you would hear from Alan Kay. Um, the the more important part of that interview is him talking about education um, and how Steve Jobs. Uh, got distracted by the shiny object that is consumer products um, rather than bicycle for the mind. Um, uh, and so hearing him talk uh, again about education and how people learn or don't um, and what we have settled for uh, with uh, especially our mobile devices. Uh, we've got little TVs rather than, than bicycles for the mind. Um, uh, it's really affective for me. Um, and one of the things he says is that uh, things like reading and writing are technological inventions. Um, he talks about uh, 20 human and universals. Um, uh, uh, things, things like technologies like reading and writing or agriculture are things we invented and actually bootstrap us up out of being the people before we had agriculture or reading and writing. Um, and uh, we don't do a good job of shepherding uh, the use of those technologies. Uh, we don't teach them to our kids. We teach our kids to be, uh, we, to have learned helplessness. Um, and like us, we all, uh, all of us have learned helplessness when we're trying to think about stuff or reason about stuff or um, augment our intelligence together. Um, uh, so I think I can make a little segue to my rant uh, with, uh, with, with Gil uh, in the chat. Um, uh, uh, and, and so I guess I want to say what I said in chat um, uh, in speech too, that I, I really do feel like, um, I and mean, we've been doing it for a long time, uh, we get cozy in talking uh, here and we don't digest uh, our material. We don't do stuff with the wonderful, amazing, brilliant insights and thinking that we have. Um, we spool them off onto YouTube um, or even onto Otter or even onto the AWS machine transcriptions I used to build. And, you know, they kind of like just settle like, like dust or something like that. Um, the metaphor I came up with, with Gil, um, it's a lot like watching a bunch of kids playing um, Legos or dinosaurs or uh, tea sets and, and, and dolls um, in, the in the living room. And then the kids are done with their playtime and it's like they get up and leave. And all the toys and stuff is scattered all over the place. Um, we, don't, we don't do a good job of uh, and, and expecting the adults to pick it up. Like, oh, you know, when I was three, mom used to pick up my stuff. I used to make a mess and mom picked it up. Now I'm six, now I'm eight, you know, I'm just gonna leave. I don't, I don't have responsibility over the things that I've kind of spewed into the, into the space, you know. Um, it feels a lot like that to me. And, and I apologize for, for sounding frustrated and, and maybe a little harsh. Um, and, and maybe I don't apologize. Um, uh, we've, we've had so many, we've mined so much gold here, um, or we've mined so much ore, uh, and we see the little uh, uh, glints of, of gold metal, and we don't do anything with it. Um, uh, and, and, you know, it's, it's not true. We do a little bit of work here and there, and, you know, we've built a, a little bit of stuff, but not as much as we could have. And we don't need uh, a third party expert um, or genius to do that work. That's like asking mom to do the work. Um, we can do it ourselves. We have to slow down a little bit. We have to have different modalities where we have playtime and then the cleaning up time. But just like when you were a little kid and you got this revelation, oh, you mean I can make a mess 
And then I can switch into a new phase where I clean the mess. And the cleaning is actually kind of fun too. The organizing is kind of fun too. It's a different kind of creativity or it's a different kind of more drudgery than not, but it's, it's productive and valuable. And look how clean my, my living room, look at the toy box when I'm done. Uh, I have all these wonderful things organized rather than not organized and scattered all over the place. Um, a brief comment then, and then I'll pass it to you, Gil. Um, I'm not fond of the waiting for mom analogy much at all, uh, but I just want to ask in sort of the, the generative spirit, like, so, uh, and I think I can, I can answer this myself too, but what things do you wish we had done by now? <clears throat> like, what, what things should we have accomplished? Um... Uh, uh, so we, we, we bubble up, um, you know, we bubble up 20 or, or 30 topics a call. Um, we never have a call where we dig into one of those and produce a podcast. So thanks, Jerry, for coming up with Weaving the World. And I hope Weaving the World does that. Um, uh, that's, that's an example, right? An another example is... Um, uh, I, I don't, I don't know that, well, so I would do this every call. Um, we wouldn't have to do this every call, but we could have some calls where instead of like floating the whole call, uh, in this dreamy reverie where we're either happy about things or sad about things or frustrated about things or hopeful about things or scared to death of the future. Um, if we slowed down and built artifacts together while we were talking, let's draw, let's write something, anything. If we had, it doesn't have to be every call, but if we did that, you know, every third call, or every fifth call, every 10th call, and we've got this, so I, it would be interesting, Dre, and I don't think we should take the time on this call to, to talk about the, the mom analogy. And I, I think in my mind, I was wondering if it's mom or parent or dad or what, you know, the, the gender of that person is kind of interesting. But, but we do have this, I wish somebody would clean up our mess for us. I wish somebody would organize our things. I wish somebody would like uh, do a visual, um, you know, uh, visual note taking of our, of our sessions. It's not rocket science, folks. It's just practice. Um, and just because I can't make music like Billie Eilish and Finnegan, her brother, doesn't mean that I can't make music that's good. And it doesn't mean that I should, should spend my days, I, you know, so I do this a lot. Um, right in front of me, I got this beautiful MIDI keyboard and I've got an iPad over here that's got uh, every musical sound I could ever, ever want to make and about a, a thousand times as many. Um, I spent a lot of time going, ah, it's, it's frustrating. You know, when I plink around, it, sometimes it sounds good and it, sometimes it sounds bad. I, you know, like get off, get, let's get off our butts and actually do it. Um, if we started drawing stuff, would it hurt us so much? If we started taking, if we started writing uh, a, an essay together, would it hurt so much? I don't think so. And and even if it's never as good as uh, Mary Bateson, it's going to be something, and we will have learned to do it ourselves, and we will level up rather than continuing to be the kids in the living room. Um, uh, Stacy then. Gil than me. If I can so, just respond here. Uh, well, Mark, if you go after Stacy, uh, <laughs> just for a sec, because Stacy did like catch my I almost, eye. Oh, oh, almost please, lost yeah, my train sorry. of thought. Yeah. Um, okay, so to what Pete said. Right down, Mark. <laughs> um, so one of my biggest challenges is I just don't know how to do some of this stuff. And I'm wondering if it might be worthwhile for all of, as a group activity to bring in a teacher, somebody that actually does this all the time that maybe teaches media and we workshop it together because I think it would be fun to do and it would be a learning experience. And I can't be the only person I, that doesn't I, know what to do. Maybe just the only person in this group. I can do the things that I just talked about um, and I've done them with people on calls and I do them all the time. So. I, I'm I'm in favor of bringing in people better than me. I'm in favor of no, bringing you in would be geniuses. Great. 
Um, but literally, you know, two hours a week, I'm sitting around on massive Wiki Wednesday calls, either doing this kind of stuff or not doing it because nobody cares. Nobody, nobody shows up. Um, but you see I'm happy. I'm happy to schedule. I, you know, let's let's do it. Let's pick a time and do it. I love teaching. I love showing off how to do stuff. I suck at everything I do. I'm an amateur at everything I do. So I don't think that I'm brilliant at it, but I'm certainly willing to to draw with people on an iPad on Zoom. I'm certainly willing to bring up uh, an essay, uh, a place to write essays. Um, we we actually tried different experiments of let's have everybody working on the same computer. Let's have everybody working on different computers on the same text. Uh, we 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 do that all the time or we can do that all the time and i would love to do more of it i would totally love to do more of it let's let's pick some times and do it yeah I, I would love that and just to be clear like whenever i hear you say massive wiki i have no idea what that is <laughs> i have no idea if i if i should show up and see what's going on or i just totally assume... fair uh totally fair um uh the totally fair and and if you sometimes if you think well i you know we get into different discussions on massive wiki sometimes it's a very technical thing about how you build nuts and bolts of bytes and stuff like that um uh so maybe well I, I i would love to schedule more time together let's essay together let's draw together let's think visually together um and i'm happy to call those things like uh, an accomplishment rather than a technology. You're totally right. Uh, the Massive Wiki Wednesday is named after technology. That's actually not what we do there usually. Um, I mean, it's related to the technology, but we do fun stuff. It's it's uh, craft time more than more than that. Who just shared the elephant image? Oh, that was me. Oh, thanks, Julian. Appreciate that. <laughs> it was thanks, the elephant was, in the room. I was just wondering who was sharing the image. Thanks for doing that. <laughs> It was because of what you mentioned earlier, the old phrase about biting the elephant, and then Stacy saying, you know, there's all this stuff you don't know how to do. And it yeah, yeah. Um, so let's go Mark Gilmey. And Mark, you've just frozen on us. It's the internet uh, gremlins that detected you were about to say something brilliant. They're like, nope, nope, not happening. Yep, the internet has been dropping out, so. You're back. Darn you, Sonic.net, <laughs> or, or Eero, or God knows what. But anyway, um, so the Internet Archive has gone from this focus of bits in. How can we archive everything because nobody else is doing it? And now the focus is bits out. And I'm stuck in bits out. Um, I'm on the bits out team. Um, okay, I'm losing connection. Somebody speak and I'll hear it. Um, yes, can you hear us? Yes. Okay. You sound normal to me. Okay. Um, Mark, Mark, I don't know what bits out means. Can you say? Bits out is um, taking the digital objects, the digital things within the archive and making them presentable. How do you find the 1978 hillbilly music that you're really into? Um, how do you download it in a way that's useful to you how do you read an online book um yeah I'll, thanks pete output um and i think that the focus should be on bits through um brought up um michael polanyi's personal knowledge notion that michael and, and pete and some of us know that all knowledge is personal it has to go through you know, the stuff in that skull to actually be knowledge. But then there's the opposite limit case that all knowledge is social, um, or at least some knowledge is social. So basically, um, I salute Pete, and I basically just want to point out, hey, um, take a notepad and write down the things you hear and the things you uh, convert that, that pop up for you and post them on the... Uh, um thing that has matter most which is called csc in the ogm channel um like i do um and i'd love to know if anybody bothers to read the stuff that i write 
writing down the things that people say in these meetings, but I don't care. I just do it because I heard this wonderful term, it's my lifestyle, <laughs> which, which I actually disagree with. It's an experiment I would rather have someone else do, but I'm doing it because I don't see it being done by anybody and I'm happy to share it. Done. Um, thanks, Mark. Uh, Gil and me. Yeah, several comments which may turn into my check-in after all. <clears throat> um, uh, Julian, great elephant, I'd love to see it animated so we can know that the elephant can actually get eaten, that'll be fine. Um, uh, Pete Kaminsky, I love you, man, I really do. Uh, I love the way your mind works. I love your generosity of spirit, and thank you. Um, on the on the mom metaphor, I want to play with that a little bit. Um, I, I get what you're saying. I get the value of what you're saying in market. You echo that. Um, uh, I don't have time in my life. I think my my interpretation is that I don't have time in my life to do that. Uh, and I think about on the one hand, you know, writers who rent a hotel room and just live there for a while to finish their book or go to a writer's retreat where somebody else is taking uh, taking care of meals and cleaning up the dishes and cleaning up the living room and they just write and walk by the beach and do whatever they do. Um, um, and I, you know, I resonate with that metaphor because I'm looking at how do I do the, the creativity and production that we're talking about here while also earning a living doing other things and being caregiver to Jane and so forth. So I, I feel generally overwhelmed all the time and behind all the time on the things that I want to do. On the other hand, you know, I think about um, I think about the Renaissance painters who went out and gathered their own pigments and ground their own paint. And that was part of the complete process of creating a painting for them. It wasn't just like something else that was in the way of the painting, it was part of it. Uh, there's a gorgeous piece about Laurie Anderson in the New York Times this weekend. I don't know if people have seen it. Um, but one of the things she does after like, what, 50 years of doing these immersive performances filled with electronic gadgetry and projection gadgetry and so forth, she has a giant trunk that she lugs around with her everywhere she performs in the world. And she insists on doing all of her own setup and tear down. No roadies. It's part of the work for her. So Pete, I hear that in what you're saying. Uh, and I like it a lot. Uh, I, I, the, the richness of it uh, is you know, deeply resonant for me. And I'm living in this challenge of feeling behind all the time, um, you know, got to bring in the billables and I don't even have time to go read matter most after these things, much less post all of my cookings to it. Um, I'm, I'm you know, sort of catching stuff on the fly in Obsidian, which is my new play space for this stuff. Uh, but I observed that even there, I'm not, doing the um, um, the end of the day or every week go out and weed the garden, which is part of the work of being a gardener. Uh, so that all said, I love your idea of the experiment. Let's do what you said maybe once a month, a dedicated session to that, maybe once a month and see what that's like. And then we can increase the rhythm, decrease it, change it. But I like the experiment, so thank you. A piece than me. Thanks, Gil. Um, my my reflection is: you don't have time not to do it. We don't have time not to do it. Um, it's it's kind of the, the Zen thing, right? Mm -hmm. uh, like um, we generate so much stuff that falls and doesn't do anything. Yeah. If we generated one thing and did it really well, we'd be ahead. We'd you know after a year and a half of doing this, we'd have something rather than a, a bunch of <clears throat> dust on the floor. Mm -hmm. We have to do it and we have to get better at it. And I, I totally get it. I, I feel crushed and, and you know, weighted down by like lots of stuff. I think part of that is that it's, uh, it's, it's a lot like when your parents said, you know, if you play with your toys and then you organize your toys after you play with your toys, the next time you want to play with your toys, you'll be able to play with them. You'll be able to find the dollar, the dinosaurs or the dollies instead of like they're scattered all over the place. It's kind of the same thing. You come, you know, you where where it's kind of a Zen thing, you know, um, uh, uh, before enlightenment, after enlightenment, you know, um, uh, or it's, it's like, like eating, uh, the, the, these calls feel to me like a high sugar diet, you know, 
and we're not any, ev we don't ever eat any vegetables we don't ever like process any nutrients we don't you know we don't like there's it doesn't happen um so we're we're on this constant sugar rush rather than having a, a nutritious balanced diet that lets us uh, evolve as a group brain and um and actually like articulate ourselves to the world rather than kind of always having this fuzzy buzzy like dream state going on so i i think we have to do it i don't i don't i don't think it's and you know and and if there aren't enough hours in the week and maybe that's true um uh then then what you do is you do a balanced diet of stuff instead of all the fizzy buzzy sugar stuff and nothing else you say well i can have a little bit of sugar and then i can have a little bit of protein and i can have a little bit of vegetables and stuff like that um and i think that's what we should do on these calls um, over time and once a month would be great um it would be better than never um michael then me and then we gotta sort of wrap our calls um I just wanted to uh, start turning off my video so it sounds better. Thank you. Um, the the uh, picking up on what you're saying, Pete, and the um, the playroom uh, metaphor. I feel like we get together, we play with our toys, and we actually do put them back in the like big bin, and <clears throat> then we take a picture of it and post it on YouTube. And that's the extent of our sharing. You know, the, the, the recorded video is there to remind us, but it's not really something that somebody outside the group can really find and derive the value from. And um, part of, if we want to use the toy chest metaphor, you know, part of it is not, not just like putting away your toys, but organizing and labeling your toys and, and individually, you know, posting them, sharing them in a findable way because you've tagged them a lot. And, you know, I know I'm going from metaphor to literal, but, um, but that I, I feel like we need to figure out ways to get more granular. And, and I caught myself just now using the figure out word term, which I like I, I've pinned on us before, you know, I, I've I've poked you, Jerry, with it sometimes, you know, where where it's we're in a constant strict state of trying to figure out what we're going to become and do and to be able to say I don't know what we're going to become and do, but we discussed this one thing, um, and here it is. It's it's findable. It's it's granularized. Um, I, I'm not saying I know exactly how to do it, but we certainly have to record in a way that um, that allows for that. I feel like. And, uh, Thank you. Um, all right. I've been taking notes in the in the chat. Um, so this is a slow journey and it's frustrating and I am frustrated too and I appreciate your expressions. Um, the way that this podcasty thing and the big fungus are showing up is informed by all of our frustrations here and everything we just said. So the idea is that there are episodes of a show and it's like, oh, great. But then there are post episodes of the show where we slow down, pay attention to what got said, distill it, connect it, put it in, put it into the big fungus, whatever the hell that means. And we need to know better what the big fungus is other than it's a couple of GitHub repos and some videos that are posted under open license on YouTube. And there's this brain object sort of sitting out there. So, so I think that, that I'm trying, like I've been listening and learning and I've been learning a tremendous amount from, from all of our calls together. And, the thing I think we're building keeps shape-shifting in front of me. And so my, my articulation of weaving the world and the big fungus are as close as I've gotten to some fruitful process that will get us to do a lot of the things that we're talking about. 
Uh, but then um, the, my MO here is to float ideas and see who likes them and catches them and goes and does something. So a very long time ago, uh, Max Harper took one of our transcripts, one of our automatic transcripts of the calls, mapped it in Miro, and you could see how the dialogue worked and did that once and hasn't really uh, stepped back into the conversation here very much. Uh, but that was really, really interesting. Uh, Kiko Lab, as it was going going hot, was doing a lot of post processing and a lot of gratitude work and a lot of other kinds of stuff. Post processing, you know, trying to mine what had you know what had happened on the calls. And uh, Charles was on me to make sure that I took the transcript files and all the other files and put them someplace where they were handy. But then Kiko Lab got got you know hit a road bump and nobody else sort of picked up those those pieces of the work um, along the way. Um, I'm always, and, and I, I'm realizing this just during this call. So these are my notes right now during this call. I've got six open tabs of stuff that my machine is not fast enough to catch up for me to, to go do, but I've got Michael Polanyi and our own metaphors, which I've never read and now might have to go read and the Framingham Heart Study and the, the Kill a Sparrow campaign and the idea of hyper objects, which we didn't even talk about, but we were kind of talking about and cooperative overlapping, which I put in and Bob Horn and Bill Fenwick, which is where we started this call. I'm, I'm doing this. So whenever Mark Carranza or I are in a conversation for free, the conversation gets this annoying habit we have of taking personal notes and putting them there. And Mark, yours are sort of for your for you, but mine are for the world. And I'm I have two audiences in mind. I have, do I want to remember this? And I have, hey, I post this in the world. I want to make this useful. And then I'm stuck in this goddamn proprietary software, which I still really like but really hate. And uh, no, we haven't been able to build an alternate that I can swing to. And I'm dying to, I'm just dying to swing into something where I can do the same activity, which is by the way, Pete, cleaning the room. Like, like I feel like I'm doing this constantly and my sport is Aikido. And at the end of any Japanese sport, you clean the dojo. If you go to school in Japan, at the end of the day, the kids clean their own school, which is a, a cultural thing. In we, a sense of, we don't do it. We don't do it together. We don't do it together. So because maybe we don't have a ritual of slowing down and doing some cleaning together. I feel like I'm doing a shit ton of it all the time. Um, and I, and I, I like, do too. And, you know, we all do. And we but don't I do have no, but I have no authority over anybody. Nobody's on the payroll. There's no budget to do any of this stuff at this point. Uh, you know, none, none of the usual kind of mechanisms kind of exist. And so maybe uh, culturally, we should, we should uh, self-authorize. Okay. So culturally we should, together. We should stand these practices up and see what we can do about that. And I'd, I'd love to do that. That sounds like a, a great thing. Um, um, and then the Thursday calls, and Pete, you had put the language of reverie around them long ago. And our Thursday calls, I think only, maybe not, maybe I'm just like, like you know, but these are our reverie calls and that's the rhythm we've fallen into. And I would be completely open to perhaps, for example, alternating Thursdays. And every other Thursday is reverie day and every other Thursday is focus day. And we pick one thing and we run deep on it. And that doesn't mean we solve it or fix it because it runs 90 minutes, but we actually slow down, pay attention to one thing, share out what we know, make it better, figure out where else to put it, what else to do. I'd, be, I'd love to do that. I'd be happy to start with next Thursday's call. Um, or maybe we stand up a different call to do that. But it seems this seems like a good place to do that kind of work together. So thoughts on that, ideas, would love to, but but I've and Pete, your 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 sort of lovely rant um, also put me in the mind of there are so many things I wish we could have done along the road that we didn't quite pull off. And in Free Jerry's brain very early on, Marc Antoine Parent put a bunch of work into creating a semantic media wiki so we could write pattern languages. And then the, the first moment we started testing it, we realized, oh shit, on this particular tool, when you name a page, it's really hard to go back later and change the name of that page in a way that works in the system. And one of the things that happens in pattern languages is you change the name of the pattern lots of times until it kind of works. And so we just stopped. And he had put in a bunch of volunteer work to do that that just went no place after that, but we learned a bunch, I think, from that. But then we didn't have a place to, to write pattern languages. And media and massive wiki isn't yet a place to write for a bunch of people to collaborate on a pattern language, although it could be. And one of the things I'd like to do in a project tile is figure out what, what do we need to add to massive wiki so that it can be the home for a whole bunch of pattern languages, because I've got a lot of stored energy and I know a bunch of other people with a lot of stored energy to go write some pattern languages, including my friend Marie Bureda and a bunch of others who, who like really want to go to town uh, doing that. 
Um, and then connected immediately to that is one of the first things I would like to do as a community is go go take the liberating structures and the wiser democracy and the pure gaji and the other sorts of pattern languages that already exist out there and, and fold them into the big fungus, whatever that means, and then in, make those more useful in the world, which is one of the things that's missing from all of our activities. We're not, uh, we're not leaving behind useful trails of the things that we're doing and seeing. And I feel like I'm trying as hard as I can in the limited tool that I've got, this brain thing, which I'm obsessed with, to make things really useful and findable later. And I feel like when we discover stuff, I, I put it in some place where it can be found again later and be put to work in a good way. And, I, and I'm like, phew, thank goodness. And I don't know how to convince other people to do the same thing. And I don't know how to find other people who are obsessed with mapping and memorializing the way we are, Mark, uh, you and I with these tools. And, and Pete, you have a different form of it. Um, that's why I think you're a maven, uh, but not necessarily a curator of the fungus in a way, um, because you don't put things in a place where they're found later, right? There's no there's no place to to find your stuff, although sort of, but not really. Like like the, the amount of I have the same feeling about the brain. <laughs> okay, so so we should Sherry's talk more is, about this. It's fairly opaque to me. Um, we should talk more about this and figure out how to go through it. But but Gil. Um, I'm interested in, and you're in Obsidian, which Pete says is a lot like Rome, which I don't, I don't understand how, how those are the same, but there's a cult of Rome out there, people who are busy building personal knowledge graphs and a whole bunch of interesting note-taking practice. Like, how do we converge these things so that, Gil, as you walk through your day, um, taking notes and writing stuff and creating blog posts and whatever, that these all become artifacts that are better shared, better available, better connected, more collaboratively written, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's a really uh, fun- for, Forget Rome, use Obsidian and connect it through Massive Wiki. So Pete let's- off, Pete offline, if you could show me how to connect it through Massive Wiki, I'm happy to experiment with that. Um, and so I think that, that that's a route, uh, a route to go down. Um, uh, and let me, I'll go to Mark and Doug in just a sec. I just wanna make sure I uh, finished what I was saying. Um, I love the word dilettante and it comes from delight. <laughs> And a dilettante has become a bad thing, but it used to be a good thing. It used to be somebody who sort of loves a lot of things. And it's like, it's like I love the word amateur, which comes from amor, which comes from love, right? It's like, these are, these are great things. Um, and I think I've made it through all my, all my notes. Uh, so let's go Mark and Doug and uh, breathe a little bit and then wrap our call. I, when I was self-employed, I used to make a joke that uh, I work for a total flake. Um, <laughs> I can identify. We know that. Uh, so you know, uh, absent micromanager. Um, I have been uh, encouraged to use the space of the Internet Archive to um, do stuff. I've talked with Monica Anderson, who some of us know, um, who did a uh, AI meetup um, in Palo Alto for a decade. Um, but I'm really interested in moving from individual note-taking to um, what the social thing is. And I know it doesn't exist yet and it's an emergent thing, but um, basically I've been attempting to figure out how to put together a social memex gathering at the Internet Archive that could also be online -y as well. Um, you know, not restricted to uh, the... Uh, the participants um and you know it might be nice to do just something local and then say okay now that we've done this local thing how do we do it a little bigger next month um but anybody who's interested and wants to help out uh i can certainly uh uh benefit from not doing it alone Thanks. and i'd love to collaborate with you on stuff in these ways so that's yeah. and it's great to hear that mark because in my head I keep thinking of you and your work as private to you. Very quickly, it's not private to me, um, except that, you know, minuscule, I, I looked at it and it's basically, you know, um, about 1%, um, not private, but um, let's call it adult. Um, I swear a lot. <laughs> um, that's my okay. list for fuck is the most hilarious thing in the. Oh, good. We could put a little NSFK or something like that next to it. But there's but there's very little private stuff too. Um, I 
think that's what I wanted to respond to, but maybe not. But um, yeah, I'll, I'll let it go. Um, thanks. I, I'll I'll be in touch. Thanks, Mark. Doug. Well, I keep writing by myself for myself to clarify what I'm thinking and waiting for the time when the group gets to some kind of project. And I think Pete is on the right uh, wavelength uh, to join the shift my writing uh, into a group environment. And so I'm really looking forward to that. And I'd back it up by saying between now and Christmas, uh, I will be ready to devote uh, time and effort to doing that if it materializes. Thanks, Doug. And and I just want to point out sort of a practicality of this. Uh, I, I have uh, way too many tabs open in front of me, some of which are big essays or book drafts from people I know and respect and have not made it through. Mm -hmm. And reading a whole lot of prose is hard and time consuming. And paying attention to the prose and digesting it and offering back suggestions or weaving it into my brain is is more time consuming but delightful like like when i hit some good when i hit good prose i'm really happy and i'm busy doing a lot of weaving just for myself into this into this odd tool but i'm wondering how we create collective works where we can do the tldr for each other where we can summarize and encapsulate uh, modularize, I don't know what this is. And I don't, I don't know what the process is because, because I won't have enough hours in my life to read all the interesting pieces that we're all trying to generate, but I'd love to help us all collectively generate a lot of great material in whatever medium we like. If it's, if it's talking head videos that we post to, to Twitch TV, awesome, great. Um, or, or, or TikTok duets, which I just learned about in the last day or two. Um, so, so yeah, any, any, Final thoughts on this fruitful but bumpy thing? Nothing well, I think that, that bits out really describes a lot of our problem. We're, we keep looking for way, places to put our stuff, but don't look at ways of getting it out. Mm -hmm. uh, Julian. Uh, I was gonna mention this whole topic of finding out stuff just yeah, it's kind of a write-only mode. There's all this stuff that's being put out there, but the whole basis of the knowledge management field is that if you can't get to it, it's useless. And there is quite a huge litany of stuff going on in that respect. Um, I would like to to do introduce some of this into the chats, but it would have to be after those conferences that I'm doing just because of time constraints. But the uh, the brain is a good example. The only thing you can search on is text in the node names. And... That, that's kind of silly. The, actually, the, actually, text in the notes works, I think, as well. And if I had turned on the indexing for pages, you could do text in the content of the pages I've linked to, but I turned that feature off. But yes. So if you go into the world of KM, you find out that you can search for all kinds of stuff and you can do analyses on the contents of your knowledge base and then do searches based on those likewise. So part of the problem with discovery comes from the tools. This is why I refer to the brain as a baby da a graph database. Uh, so I will commit to, to bringing out some introductions of, of this stuff in a later call. So sounds great. Thank you, Julian. Godspeed with your conferences. Um, any other last thoughts? Uh, Pete. Um, uh, I'm, I'm so happy that we're talking about tools. Um, and tools is the wrong place to, to, to focus because you get you get, oh, I hate this tool, or I don't like this tool, or this tool works great for me, but it doesn't work for you. Um, when we start thinking about what we want to do, how we want to brain together more, we should think about what we want to accomplish um, and not think about what tool will we accomplish it with. And you're making me think of what does it, what is the equivalent of sweeping the dojo in OGM? I, I would love it if if we had a memory, even. Um, we do. Uh, we've, got an, we've got an OGM wiki and a massive wiki. I mean, we, we have a fledgling memory on your platform. Uh, we don't feed it. Uh, we don't read it. Yeah. Um, OK, well, let, let's come back to this. this is, I, I agree. I would like to see our things exist in the world. Stacy, you can have the last word for today's call. Quick question. What's the best way for me to introduce myself to Massive Wiki? Uh, yeah. Schedule some time with me. Bingo. Okay. Thanks. I'll send you an email. Thank you. 
All right. Bye. Thanks, everybody. Okay. Bye, Sue.